this coming Sabbath in every synagogue throughout the world, Jews will read from the portion of the Torah, the Jewish law, and they will read the following. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. That was the beginning of Zionism. That and not Theodor Herzl. And it was not in Basel, Switzerland in 1897 that a Jewish state was founded, but it was on a night 4,000 years ago, the land of Canaan, that the Almighty God pledged that the Jewish people would be a special people, a chosen people, and that the land would be theirs. Ever since then, there have been nations that have attempted to dispute that claim. And what we are seeing now in Israel, the attempt by Arabs to claim that that land is theirs and that it is called Palestine is nothing more than the latest phase in an effort on the part of many, many nations to dispute not only the Jewish claim, of the divine claim. I think it is imperative that we grasp this because this is the, the essential nub of the uh, problem. We are not dealing with the problem of the 1967 boundaries. That is not the problem. Because before the 1967 war broke out, and when the Arabs had all of the land that they now claim must be given back to them or else there will be no peace. There was still no peace. And when the so-called moderate King Hussein of Jordan, who daily trumpets the fact that there will never be peace unless Israel gives up East Jerusalem, when King Hussein had East Jerusalem in 1967 and went to war, the question arises, why? It is eminently easy to give easy answers. If we give up land, there will be peace. If we don't give up land, there will be peace. Demagogues say that because the truth is that there will not be peace no matter what Israel does. And we're not speaking here of peace. We're speaking here of Jewish survival a survivor which is threatened by the Arabs who massacred Jews in the 1920s, before there was a Jewish state. What in the world possessed the Arabs in Hebron, in Hebron in 1929, to massacre 67 Jews in one day? Who incited them then? Kahana, who wasn't even born? Begin, who was a tiny child in Poland? No one incited the Arabs in 1929. What incited the Arabs in 1929 was an idea, Zionism. That is what they oppose, not Mayor Kahana, not Zionist hawks or Zionist doves. What bothers the Arabs is Zionism, a Jewish state of any size, of any shape, and of any form. Peace? You want peace? I have an instant peace plan. Give up Israel, and you'll have peace. And Auschwitz again and again and again. Zionism did not come in, into being for peace. It came into being for a Jewish state. And hopefully with peace. But peace or no peace, a Jewish state. And on, and on that, there is no compromise. Arafat is not interested in Hebron. To him, there is no difference between a Hebron in Judea or a Jaffa. He believes that both are Arab cities. He believes that there is no difference between a Haifa or a Nablus, Shechem. And he's right. Of course he's right. There is no essential difference. 
They're both ours. We have no right to a shechem. There is no nablus, nablus. And people say, but that's the Arab name. That's not the Arab name. The Romans conquered Shechem and called it Napolus, Naples. The Arabs have difficulty pronouncing a P, so Napolus became Nabolus. And if anything, we should give it back to the Italians. There's no Nabolus, there was Shechem. Ask any Baptist. He reads the Bible. He never heard of Nabolus. He knows Shechem and Hebron and Yericho, Jericho. These are not Jewish cities. Then indeed we have no right to a to a Tel Aviv that was built in 1905. Our claim, when we returned in the 1880s and, and 1890s, our right to come back was based not upon a Tel Aviv that had not yet been built. It was based upon the fact that our father Abraham, 4,000 years ago, lived in Hebron. And our father Jacob in Shechem. That is our claim. And on that, there's no compromise. What we have here is a struggle between two peoples who both believe that the land belongs to them. The tragedy is the Jewish liberals and the Jewish left who have such contempt for the Arabs. Enormous contempt. We should raise their living standards, and then they'll be good Arabs. If we give them education, then they'll be good Arabs. If we give them electricity and, and indoor toilets, then they'll be good Arabs. What content for the Arabs? What content for human beings? You can't buy the Arabs' national pride with an indoor toilet. The Arabs believe the country's there. They're not ready to say, well, it's really ours, but give us an indoor toilet and we'll be satisfied. Only a Jew of national pride can understand Arab national pride. Now, of course, it's not their, their country. Of course, it is not, but they believe it is. So stop playing games with them. Living standards. The problem is not living standards. The problem is not education. <laughs> the matter is, he is here, and I live in Jerusalem. It's quite all right. It's quite all right. We'll continue okay. this. I'm fine. Let's continue. God is good. That's quite all right. Quite all right. Let's continue. This Arab is in Washington, and this Jew lives in Jerusalem. Quite all right. That's all right. Let's continue. I think that it's clear that when we speak of education, Clearly the most dangerous of all Arabs are the educated ones. Clearly the Arab who is now studying at Hebrew University will be the intellectual. He will be the leader. He will be the PLO leader tomorrow. And so there will be no compromise. The solution, not to peace, to the survival of Israel will be the expulsion of the Arabs from Israel. And may they all live here and attempt to do in Washington what they do to me here now, but they will certainly not have a Palestine. And indeed, the desperation here is really the ultimate that they can possibly do. <clears throat> Our strength in Israel is growing. And indeed, the invitation to me to speak here this morning was greeted in Israel by an uproar on the part of the Democratic 
liberals. They're afraid. That's the reason why, why I can speak here and yet not speak on Israel radio or TV. I am barred from Israel radio and TV. Because our strength grows, our strength grows enormously. The Sephardic Jews of Israel, those who make up the majority, are the supporters of Kahana. They know what Arabs are. They did not learn about Arabs at Georgetown University in some seminar. They learned about Arabs by living with them in Arab countries, and they left those Arab countries, and they fled those Arab countries, and they never again want to live under Arabs in any country. Those are my voters. I'm convinced that there will be an election within the year. I'm convinced that Shimon Peres and his, and his parasites will never allow Shamir his whole term. And in this next election, there is not the slightest doubt that we will be the third party in Knesset. There is not the slightest doubt that we will be a balance of power in the Knesset. There is not the slightest doubt that we will have a say and an, and an uncompromising say in an Israel which will annex the territories, the West Bank, Gaza, make them part of the state of Israel, and begin the process of moving the Arabs out. The future is ours. And indeed, every tragic attack upon a Jew, and I say this sadly, with a heavy heart, gives us strength. And so, it is imperative that we begin to understand and to grasp the demographic problem inside Israel, it's not the PLO which threatens Israel. They are pinpricks. This is a PLO type. They can't hurt us. It's a demographic problem. The Arabs of Israel are citizens of Israel. Israel is a democratic state. It claims to be a Western democratic state, which means that all the citizens, Jews, Arabs, vote. Zionism stands in stark contradiction to that concept. Zionism came in, in, into being as a Jewish state. And what does a Jewish state mean if, if not a state with a majority of Jews in which we control our own destiny? Of course that's Zionism, certainly. Western democracy and Zionism are at odds. There is a contradiction here. And we have to choose. And if that is a painful thing for most Jews to uh, hear, so be it. So be it. But pain in no way modifies truth. We will offer the Arabs compensation for their property if they leave quietly. If they will not leave quietly, we will force them out of the country in exactly the same manner that the Poles and the Czechs in 1945 expelled 12 million ethnic Germans from their countries, and not a cry was heard in the world. The Poles and the Czechs had learned bitterly to the dismay, to the horror, what a fifth column means inside their own country. And after World War II ended, and they licked their wounds to millions of uh, dead, they expelled the Germans. India and Pakistan saw an exchange of 18 million people, Hindus and Muslims. Greece and Turkey in the 1920s, and then again with Cyprus, saw a wholesale exchange of peoples. I have no guilt over wishing to live. For 2,000 years, we enjoyed such dubious benefits from the Gentile world as crusades and inquisitions and pogroms and Auschwitzes of all time. I appreciate all of that, but thank you, but no thank you. We want our state. No apologies for it, no guilt feelings for it. There's only one thing worse than killing Arabs, it's seeing our own people killed. And Judaism cries out, if one comes to slay you, slay him first. That's not Kahana, that's Judaism. And indeed, that is logic. 
My son served in Lebanon in artillery. And he received orders that they were not to give fire cover to the infantry if the infantry was attacking PLO positions in villages, lest they kill innocent women and children. Do you know how many Jewish soldiers died because of that insane order? Do you know how many Jewish soldiers had to go in under sniper fire with no cover? That is ethics and morality? That is insanity. When I serve in the, in the army, I want my CO to first and foremost think about me and not the enemy. Innocent civilians? Were there innocent civilians in Hamburg, Germany, in Berlin, in Dresden, in Essen, when the Allied bombers bombed those cities? Did anyone stop and say, you can't bomb those cities because there are innocent people there? We were fighting a war against an enemy which, had he won, would have plunged the free world into a nightmare. Well, we face an enemy now in Israel that if it wins, turn the pogroms of the 1920s and 1930s in Palestine to something far more horrible than that. There is no compromise here. If the Arabs wish a Palestine state, let them create it in Jordan or anywhere else. Not my country. The Arabs have 22 countries. May they live and be well. We have one country. The only one. And it will live. The world is happy about it, it's happy. And if it's not happy, it is not happy. Final word about terror. I find it obscene, incredible to, to watch a U.S. government, which for years has chastised the entire world for doing business with terrorists, with nations that back terror suddenly doing things that if Jimmy Carter would have done them, he indeed would have been impeached, if not lynched, by Ronald Reagan. Terrorism knows only one answer, and that is counter-terror. We are living in the Middle East, not the Middle West. In the Middle West, perhaps, you can sit down over coffee and cake and deal with issues, because people here are basically decent. In the Middle East, you are dealing with a mentality which is, total, which is totally different. You may call Shiites here madmen and other, other names. One man's fanatic is, 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 is the other person's believer. And that's what we are dealing with. And they understand strength and not weakness. And if, and if you show goodness, you are in good, you are weak. And if you are weak, you are dead. And if this country wants to ensure that bombs will not be going off in, in supermarkets here, in Washington, in New York, in Chicago, then understand that you have to root out that terror with ruthlessness. Because as the rabbis say, he who has mercy upon the cruel will someday be cruel unto the merciful. And if we have a perverted concept of ethics, we will cause the deaths of innocent people in this country and in other countries of the world. In short, it's not only Israel, it's the West, the free world which is in a struggle against people who want to impose upon that world a view, a regime which would plunge that world into a nightmare. You want to win, you fight a war. If you don't want to win, you don't fight a war. But you don't fight and not fight that at the same time. With God's help, the, the pledge, of the covenant to it, Abraham will be. With God's help, we will be in power in Israel within this coming decade. And with God's help, this individual will be joined by many others who may gnash their teeth, but the Jews will be home in Jerusalem. Thank you.
Thank you, Rabbi Kahana. We'll open the floor to questions now. I'll ask, please, that you identify yourself and your affiliations. Rabbi, I'll turn this over to Rabbi Kahana. Yes, yes, sir. Great clerk, WHU. Our first question. Are you all right? I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay, my second question is uh, the recent release of the uh, two Frenchmen in Syria, and it appears that Syria is being used as sort of a I don't know, a scapegoat and a favorite child now and helping the release of many hostages uh, being held in Lebanon. Do you see that their influence will play more in the, the role of the Middle East now? I uh, fear so, yes. I'm afraid that, uh, what Ron, that, that what Ronald Reagan has done is a step that is so serious, so incredibly serious. What he has done is, is first of all, undercut undercut any attempt by Great Britain or this country to counter terror. But more than that, as you say, Syria and other nations, Iran, Syria, that, that block, has now gotten the prestige within the modern Arab world. The modern Arab world has now learned that it pays to do what Syria does, or Iran, it pays. And that's the tragedy. You don't bomb Libya. Libya is a minor, a very, very minor partner in this uh, gang of, uh, in this gang of uh, three. Syria and Iran, if we're not ready to use every possible means against them, then what will happen will, will be that they will become the leading countries, the leading states in the Muslim world. And that's what is happening now. Yes. You're right. Do you, do you see that? Um, do you see that the change of guard comes in Israel? Do you see that your party or your policies will, will, will be reviewed any more favorably? I'll say more than that. In the next election, the Likud party will not be able to govern without Kach. We will be a partner in the next government, but we will be so only if they accept basic conditions. And those conditions are firm, firm. We will demand the annexation of those parts of the land of Israel which are now in our, in our hands. We will demand the beginning of the process of offering the Arabs compensation for property. Uh, we are going to insist upon the beginning of our, of our program. And since within the Likud party, there are many, many people who feel as we do, but who haven't got the courage yet to uh, say so. We, we are convinced that they will accept those demands. Yes. Many of your critics, I understand, uh, in and out of Israel, have accused you of being an extremist or a Nazi. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to ask this question in the context of what I understand is your legislation to introduce something like the Nuremberg Laws that uh, Hitler had with the word Jew changed for Arab and a law to deny the right of any Jew in Israel to marry non-Jews. All of this smacks of Nazism and racism and extremism. What is your response? Well, it, it most certainly would if you're not a very, very deep thinker. But if you're a deep thinker, You'll, uh, you'll see the immense difference between what between what we want and what and what what the Nazi wanted. First of all, let me make quite quite clear that the ban on intermarriage between Jews and non-Jews is Judaism and not Meir Kahana. And if you can find me one Orthodox rabbi that will say that that is not so, I'll pay for your fare to Israel and back. It's in it's in the Bible. We are not opposed to marrying non-Jews because of racist reasons. What Hitler said was a Jew per se was always banned because of his race, of his blood. If a non-Jew wishes to convert and become Jewish, he is as Jewish as Khan is. That's not racism. It's a religious issue. We want our children to carry on the message of Sinai. And so therefore we want Jews to marry Jews. I have a follow -up. It's a racial issue. 
uh, you uh, seem to be indicating that conversion would be all right, but with a little pressure in favor of conversion. Not Maybe, at all. Uh, not uh, at uh, all. Uh, let me get to the point. Of, that's not my point. The point is, in view of the attitude that seems to be expressed by non-Orthodox Jewry or Reformed Jewry or liberal Jews or non-religious Jews who are only Jewish ethnically and aren't religious, say, at all, uh, do you think this would endanger the stipend, the subsidy, the help that Israel gets from America and therefore would endanger the very Israel that you are attempting to preserve? Wait, wait, wait. Your, your premises are all wrong. And then I'll get to the question. A Jew is a Jew, whether he's an observant Jew or not an observant Jew. There's no difference, no difference between Jews. One, be, one may be an atheist Jew, and that upsets me, but it, it doesn't make him less of a Jew. He may not be a good Jew in, in my eyes, but he's a Jew, as much as I am. So that takes care of that issue. Secondly, I don't want to push the Arabs into, into, into uh, Jewishness. Hardly. We Jews are not missionaries. Quite, quite the contrary. When a non-Jew comes and wants, and wants to convert, we are duty-bound to try to explain to him the difficulties in being uh, Jewish. So that only if he really, really wishes to, not because of, of the problem of in-laws, but because of Jewish laws, that is why, that is why we want that is the only type of Gentile that we accept, one who sincerely wishes to. I don't want Arabs. I, I wish Arabs to be good Muslims or good Christians or good anything. I'm going to ask them to convert. However, if they should wish to on their own, that, of course, is different. Now, as far as the, the, this entire question, would any of my policies endanger, as you call it, the stipend? I don't know what... what a stipend is, you mean foreign aid. A stipend is someone who receives a regular annual annual pension. Uh, I don't believe that America helps Israel because Israel is nice. I don't believe that any country helps a second country because it is a nice country. Countries help other countries out of self-interest. Countries help other countries because they believe it is to their interest to do so. If the U.S. government believes that Israel is to its self-interest, it will back Israel. If it does not think so, it will not back, back Israel. But more to the point, I'm a rabbi, and I'm one who believes that the state of, of Israel is not an ordinary state. And, it, and this government did, did not give a bullet to Israel in 1948. Quite the contrary. Harry Truman, one of the great friends of Israel, imposed an embargo on aid, on all weapons in the Middle East. We survived through a, an enormous miracle. This country did, did not give military aid to Israel until John Kennedy. We went through a, a 1956 war without U.S. USA. I said here, when I was here the last time at the uh, press club, I said that if, that if I will be the prime minister, we will ask for the cutting off of all economic aid from America. I don't want economic aid. Economic aid to Israel is like giving a, a, uh, a, an uh, addict his daily stipend. I don't want to be stuck on this. Israel must stand on its own feet. It can't be some beggar with one hand out to West Germany and the other to America and to bonds and to the UJA. It needs private capital. It needs Jews who learn to work. It needs capitalism and it needs hard work and it needs sacrifice, cutting the budget. It needs all of the very difficult cold turkey things that any that any addict addict needs. So hopefully America will realize that Israel is a needed ally in military terms, but in economic terms, quite the contrary. It is not helping Israel by giving it economic aid. Yes, sir. Rabbi, uh, following that point, 
what would be the basis then of Israel's relations to its neighbors? What would be the self-interest between Israel and its surrounding neighbors if, as you say, the expulsion of the Arabs would produce peace? What no. then is the basis for the self-interest between the nations that would prevent war? Excuse me. Yes. I would appreciate it very much if you would identify yourself and your I'm name. Leo Thank you. Yes, sir. I certainly never said that any of my policies would lead to a peace. I said just the opposite. No policies will lead to, will lead to peace. So you believe the war is inevitable? I didn't say that. You can go for many, many years with neither war nor peace. We went for 11 years with neither war nor peace with, with Nasser, which proves that the present state of no war with Egypt is not, is not necessarily peace. Nevertheless, I'm convinced that the, that the Arabs will not start a war with an Israel which is led by people that they believe are extremists. Uh, the Arabs would have never started a war with, uh, with uh, Begin. I think that Arabs start war with weak prime ministers. If Mayor Khan would be the prime minister, he would be the last person in the world that the Arabs would start a war with. We have nuclear weapons. Let's hope to God that we never have to use it. Let's hope to God that this country never has to use its, its weapons. But if America didn't have nuclear weapons, the Russians would, would, would be sitting right now in this press club. And you wouldn't. The same thing goes for Israel. There's no question that Syria is reaching some kind of parity with Israel in, in, in weapons, conventional weapons. There's no question that Israel will have to use its ace card as a warning, as a threat. The question is, is it a credible threat? Under Shimon Peres, it may not be. Under a Sharon or a Kahana, it would be. I don't expect peace and I don't expect war. I, I expect a continuation of this present cold peace or hot peace or anything, anything any, or, or, or the state of no war, no peace until the Messiah comes. And hopefully that will come soon. Yes. Um, my name is Pardon? Um, I like to ask, if uh, the Arabs in the West Bank and the occupied territories were refused, they refused to be expelled or to leave the country. Louder, louder, please, please. If the Arabs yes. in Israel refused to leave the country, yes. are you willing to massacre them? I haven't got the slightest fear that the Arabs will not want, will, will leave the uh, country or not leave the uh, country. Madam, 12 million Germans did not want to leave Poland and Czechoslovakia. When the army has the weapons and you don't have the weapons, you leave. You may not want to, but you leave. There will be no massacres. But don't you think they will all turn like a million and a million point three? would all turn against Israel, what you call them terrorists, they would be. How could you ensure the safety of one Israeli person one meter outside of Israel? In any airport? How do I ensure that now? Until Kahana came, there was no terror. It's only Kahana that threatens Israel with, with, Arab, with Arab terror. What kind of nonsense is that? First of all, when there are no Arabs inside Israel, one thing is guaranteed. There will be no bombs inside Israel. I go to funerals every, 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 every week in Israel. Those bombs and those bullets were not caused by Arabs in Lebanon, but by Arabs who live inside Israel. There will not be terror inside Israel. The question of terror outside Israel is not the, there, there won't be the slightest difference between Kahana or Abba Iben. So therefore, we expect terror, not only against Jews, but against many, many other peoples. We would hope that the world will deal with that terror. If Mayor Kahana would be there, I can assure you that Syria will, if Syria plans terror against Jews outside of Israel, Syria will feel terror in Damascus. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, Rabbi Akani, uh, you indicated that the Palestinians should uh, create a uh, state in Jordan if they yes. want a homeland. 
Uh, how do you think uh, King Hussein would uh, uh, react to that kind of a proposition? Uh, do you think he would? Uh, I couldn't care care less. That's his. That's his problem. That's his problem. First of all, what in the world makes Jordan a legal state? The League of Nations in 1919 created a mandate for the creation of a Jewish state on both sides of the uh, Jordan. And Britain was made the mandatory power to carry out the wishes of the, of the, of the League. In 1922, the British, by fiat, and in contravention of the, of the League, cut off the east bank of the uh, Jordan for its own puppet, the grandfather of this present puppet, and called it Trans Transjordan. He has his problems. We have our problems. Let him worry about the Palestinians who at this moment make up 75% of his, of his present country. Yes, I don't know. I want to get some people. I'm interested in that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Bob Whitten from Mutual News. Yes, sir. Do you have any indication as a member of the Knesset that Israel was working with the United States to move arms to Iran? Did you ever see any evidence of that? No. But rumors have been floating about Israel for at least two years. And I want to say right, right now that the fact that Israel was involved with this in no way makes it better. Something which is wrong doesn't become better because Israel did it. I think it's a tragedy. I think it's insanity. I think it undercuts everything that Israel, that Israel says about not doing business with uh, 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 terrorists. I, I, I find it hard to believe. I can, only, I can only hope that the Washington Post story, as so many others, is not true. Yes, sir. You said a few moments ago that we have nuclear weapons. Is that a confirmation that the state of Israel has nu nuclear weapons? Of course it has. In fact, I am constantly shocked that people are, are shocked that someone comes out and says that, that, Israel, that Israel has those weapons. Why should we hide it? Why should we hide it? Do you believe that Libya is waiting for Israel to have weapons? Do you believe that Syria is not trying to, to get atomic weapons and that only if Israel has it, then they'll get it. Of course not. Of course not. So, and I don't, I'm, I'm not so sure what the ethical difference between a conventional weapon and, a, and, and any other kind of weapon, weapon is. A blockbuster during World War II busted many, many blocks. And I don't know how moral that, that weapon, weapon was. Weapons are not moral. Weapons are tragically necessary, but never moral. Yes, sir. I'm from Al Arab, Egypt. Yes. Sir, if I understand you clearly, you mean that you are threatening the Arabs, the area, that you can use your atomic weapons. Let me finish my question. Yes, sir. What is the real value of peace, which is supposed to be existing between Egypt and Israel, and the peace which you are calling for between Israel and the Arab countries? To begin with, I would not give two rouge for the you know, peace between Israel and Egypt, to be quite uh, frank. And, I, and, if, and if I were Lloyds of uh, London, I would not ensure the life of your, uh, of your president. What will happen when radicals in Egypt will do to him what was done to the previous one? Sir, so, so just, uh, just one more moment. You were talking about peace. I don't believe that there are Arab moderates. I believe that there are two kinds of Arabs, clever ones and not clever ones. Egypt is a clever country. It realizes that it, it cannot beat Israel in a war, having tried five times and lost five times. Uh, and so, in peace, you got back the entire Sinai, an incredible tragedy on the part of Begin. Nevertheless, it was done. It will not be done with any other parts of land that Israel holds. It will not be done. Uh, I want peace. I live in Israel. I serve in the army. My son serves in the army. I want peace as much as anyone wants peace. But I'm not a fool. You don't want peace. You want Israel to give up 
the West Bank. That's what you insist upon because, because of uh, Palestine. And you want us to go back to the 1967 boundaries, and then you will, in, then and then you will be talk, talking about the UN, the UN call for the right of the refugees to go back to Jaffa and Haifa. Therefore, I can assure that had I been the prime minister, you would not be sitting in the Sinai. A mistake was made. It will not be done again. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Mahmoud, and I'm a Palestinian, and I yes. work my doctorate at Georgetown University. Uh, yes. A few minutes ago, you were saying that people like me are the real danger for Israel. And what I'm saying... No, no. You are here. You are You are, are, are no, no danger. I, I'm there. I'm there. I'm temporarily here. Ah, you mean, you mean, you mean Israel lets you back? In occupied Palestine. Uh, that's so now, the, the, that's the, the question is, yes. you have been, for the last... Uh, are so making God as Israel's God a real estate agent. Yes. And if every government on this earth that will, will, will start reshaping history mm -hmm. according to biblical premises, mm -hmm. not according to legal terms that we all abide by international law here, you are, uh, then, then, I, then, then you, you, know, you come from New York. I mean, I don't see any business for you to go and live in Palestine. We recognize that there were Jews who were living in Palestine. Uh, Hitler is that Arab? He's Jewish. He's, he's, he's European. I'm sorry. Yes. And and I don't see why you are you are, you are putting all the blame on the Arabs of being anti-Semitic. We are Semitic people. We are not anti-Semitic. We don't want to kill any Jew. But you are exaggerating and actually you are breeding the kind of ideology that will make people give up hope and maybe turn to terrorism. Which means to me you are also a terrorist yourself. I'm. Impressed constantly by a Palestinian who speaks of the observance of law, international law. And not, hey, sir, over there, over sir, you spoke and I listened, now it's my turn. This isn't the uh, Knesset, we speak one at a time. In any case, in 1947, the UN voted and decided upon the partition of Palestine into a Jewish state and a non-Jewish state, an Arab state. That was international law. I don't recall the Arabs jumping happily about and saying we will obey the international. You thought it was a bad law. I understand that. But when you don't want to follow law, you don't follow law. That's the first thing. Secondly, you're talking about you, you don't want to kill Jews. Of course not. In the 1920s, you didn't kill Jews. In the 1930s, you didn't kill Jews. The Mufti didn't, did, did not call for the killing of Jews. Between 1936 and 1938, 510 Jews were not murdered. In 1947 and 48, 6,000 Jews were not killed in a war that you began. Not you personally, but the people that you, of course, back. Your father, perhaps. I don't, I don't know. So, theref so therefore, yeah. not impressed in the slightest at your sudden call for peace. If you want peace, fine. Let's sign a peace treaty at the present boundaries, and I'll be happy to give the first check to the UAA, United Arab Appeal, to create a Palestine state in Jordan. I don't trust you. I don't believe you. And as an attorney, I can tell you that the presumption on your part is not one of innocence, but of guilt. And I don't have to make the steps of compromise. You have to make those first first steps, and not me. You are using selective morality by applying a certain moral standard to the Jew as being special and exclusive, and the Arabs are being animal, and you know we should kill them and get rid of them. And at the same time, you expect us to be so gentlemen and so nice to tell you, sir, okay, we're going to leave and here is a... Uh, I don't expect anything of you. I'm not, I, I'm not asking anything of you. The massacre of Palestinians by Jewish terrorists. There are maybe some Palestinian terrorists. I don't deny that. I'm not but also there are Jewish terrorists. terrorists. Why don't you accept I'm that? I'm speaking of 30 years prior to the year, you see. 30 years prior to it of the murder of Jews inside that country by not terrorists, by Arabs. By Arabs. By Arabs. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Elder Cruzel, uh, freelance. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, uh, there's a good possibility that Israel has uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, I was wondering. It's a good possibility. It has. It has. 
Uh, all right. Uh, yes. Well, what do you think will happen to this uh, young man uh, recently who uh, discussed this in public, I believe, for the press that uh, Israel probably had uh, uh, what nuclear weapons? Uh, I don't know. But if I'm the prime minister, he'll get out of out of jail. I think that what he did was a great thing, a wonderful thing. I think it's about time that that people knew that Israel is not ready to ever, ever again go through an Auschwitz. Never. The, the only worse thing than winning in the way that we will have to win, God forbid, would be losing. I would rather be a winner than a loser. And I would rather have the entire world hate the state of Israel, which is a winner, than love the state of Israel which is dead. Yes, sir. Rabbi, I'm interested in your uh, theology. I yes. believe I've seen uh, uh, something in print, and I just want to hear your own real views, yes. uh, that uh, 40 years or so after the state of Israel is created, uh, Israel has to put its house in order uh, in order to meet the coming of the Messiah, something like that. I, I'm no theologian. Perhaps you could straighten that out. And uh, I think that time is up in about two years. Uh, would you explain what you expect to do in two years' time uh, for the coming of the Messiah? I believe that anyone who doesn't see that we are living in a very, very special era is not a person that has no faith, but is rather blind. The concept of, of 40 years is based upon a concept in the uh, Talmud that in both of the previous two Jewish states, and there were two previous Jewish states. There was never an Arab state. In the previous two Jewish states, in the first temple and the second temple, there was a grace period given of 40 years, a final, perhaps desperate hope on the part of uh, God that the Jews would come back and return to, to, the, uh, to a Jewish, Jewish law. I simply stated that it might be possible, it might be possible that since Certainly, the state of Israel was not given to the Jews because of their merits. We certainly are, are not better Jews than our, than our uh, you know, grandparents' parents were. That perhaps there might be now, too, a grace period of 40 years given. This, is, this isn't something which is a fact. I, I, I simply threw that out as a possibility. Well, it's, it's not only a pious hope, because in Jewish law, the Messianic era can come in one of two ways. One, swiftly and beautifully, or first with prior awful tragedies. So I'm not so sure how it will come. And even my, I think that you're, that you're raising that question gives me an opportunity to point out that I'm not a politician. I'm a rabbi who's in politics. There's a great, great difference. And... Uh, I believe that if a Jew doesn't believe that there is a divine destiny, then I would say that logically there is no hope for Israel. Because in the end, certainly the Arabs will have nuclear weapons. And in the end, the Arabs will have far, far greater weapons than Israel. What I speak about is a practical Jew, and yet one who has faith in a divine destiny. That is Judaism. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, three minutes. The JDL has a history of violence in this country. Do you disapprove of it? It depends. It depends. I think that violence sometimes is, is good and necessary, and at times it is not. For example, a tax upon Arabs in this country, I think, is, is dumb, terrible, foolish. It only helps the Arabs. A tax upon the Soviets in the 1960s and 1970s were those things that put the Soviet Jewish issue on page one. And which, and which led to the freeing of some quarter million Russian, Russian, Russian Jews. Depends. Depends. Not every violence is uh, good. Sometimes it's, it's terrible. It's terribly wrong. Not every pacifism is good. Sometimes it is good, and sometimes it's terribly wrong. If, the, if all the people would have been Quakers in 1940, six million Jews would not have been killed. Eighteen million would have. Yes, sir. I'm afraid that one is the National Geographic. Uh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. The name? I'm pre Veselin with the National Geographic. Yes. Years ago in Jerusalem, I ran into quite a few moderate Arab voices who 
express the final desire that they no longer wish to supplant Israel, that they wish to live in peace mm -hmm. in their own state. Yes. Uh, do you find this is an increasing trend, and do you believe it? I don't believe it at all. Credible Arizona voice to express that idea? I believe that. Of course they, they express it. I don't believe them. It's that simple. My God. They know that war will not give them a state. They know that. And so they speak to you. We're a nice chap, an American, who was raised in, in fair play and everything else. I was also raised in that, in that way. And I went to the Middle East, and I learned about the real world. Uh, and so they tell you, of course we want peace. The same Arabs who, in 1967, were jumping around, and you saw them on TV, perhaps, shouting, throw the Jews into the, into the sea, when they thought that they could. Now they know that they, that they cannot. So therefore, they said they want peace. When, when we give them back everything, and they're once again 15 miles from the sea, what will happen then? What will happen then? The presumption is that they don't want peace. After five wars, that's the presumption. If they want to rebut that, they have to make the compromises and the changes, and not us. We suffered enough dead in wars begun by the Arabs. Yes. Mr. Yes, Cameron, yes. Oh, sorry. yes, yes, yes. Uh, you, uh, you were a U.S. citizen until recently when you were, you, you were stripped of your citizenship. I'm still a citizen. The state you, okay. department claims I'm not. It's in the courts. I know, yeah. What I would like to question really is what, what your loyalty. Is your loyalty to the United States of America or is it to Israel? And why, and you are actually, in a sense, uh, helping people who would uh, discredit uh, Jews who, who have a responsible position in the U.S. government, like in the intelligence community or even in the State Department, whether they are loyal to Israel or to the United States, after you see what happened with Jonathan Pollard and others. What is your comment on that? I, I, didn't, know, I didn't know that John, that John Walker was Jewish. I know, I know, I know. This kind of a selective choosing of Pollard, one, one Jew, the fact of the matter is that there were many, many traitors in many, many countries. A traitor is a traitor, not because he's a Jew, but because he's a traitor. And don't try to play games with me. This country allows the concept of a dual citizen. This country allows it. Many, many countries do. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. One thing, we're going to get clear. After you've asked the question, then you're silent. And then, then I speak. After I finish, you can ask a second question. All right, those are the ground rules when I speak. Now, this country allows a person to be a dual citizen, not of Israel and America, but of any country in America. And there are six million such people in this, in this country. So stop playing games with, with me. Are you more loyal to this? Ask, ask Poles, people who are Polish citizens and US citizens, are they loyal to, to Poland or, or this country? To Italy or this country? To Spain or this country? That's an, it's an, an outrageous question. I am, I am a loyal citizen of both countries, being allowed to be so by the US government. Yes. But I first wanted to comment on why he, he spoke too much, like when you wanted him to listen. It's because people you know, make press conferences for you and receive you. At the time, nobody listens to him no matter where, okay? And now I, I wanted to tell, I wanted to go on and, t and tell you, you're sitting here for an hour, yes. trying to give people the impression that you're the, the strongest and you're gonna kick the Arabs outside, and you know, if necessary even, use nuclear weapons or whatever. So you're gonna, you're trying to make this statement for the media here. And me as a Palestinian, I'm gonna make this statement that no ma time is between us and we're gonna take over. The country is ours. I mean, you have your nuclear weapon. We have our strength in, in our soul and our education that you're going to try to deprive us from. If you hadn't come here, I would have paid you to come here. <laughs> because... But you're going back. Hey, madam, madam, please, do me a great favor. Don't be an extremist. <laughs> let me speak. Madam, please, let me speak. It's important that everyone here 
But the question here is not tough on her. She believes that the entire country is hers. I understand that. You, you don't have to tell me that. I know that. Trying to let Abba Ibn. He needs that lesson. This, this is the problem. She is, she is a problem. And therefore, don't expect me to say anything less than what I said here. She's not ready to have an Israel one meter by one meter. She believes that every inch of the country is Palestine. I understand that. So therefore, why should I bother getting, getting, getting into an argument with you? Say, you will come back. In the meantime, in the meantime, you're here. When I'm there as the prime minister, believe me, I will guarantee that you and your children and your grandchildren will be in America. Yes. I have a question, sir. On the, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, the flap that's occurred over the interview in the Washington Times with Chirac and Arnaud de Borchgraf in recent days. Are you familiar with all of this? No, no, no. Well, I just it, arrived. In quick summary, the, uh, uh, Mr. Chirac speculated that in the affair of Hin Nizar Hindawi in, in Britain, that there was a mo possible uh, motivation for the Mossad and Syria both to be involved in this affair in yeah. some capacity. You mentioned uh, that, uh, for point of argument, Israel has been involved with what's being done with Iran. Would you agree that there are similar motivations that people in Israel would have been involved in the Hindawi affair? No. The last time I heard that kind of argument was when three black children were killed by a bomb in Birmingham, and the Ku Klux Klan said that it was probably done by blacks in order to blame the KKK. That's that, 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 that's that kind of thinking. Well, maybe, but it, nonetheless, if well, Israel would, with the United States, be involved in what you described as a stupid atrocity with the arms to Iran. It's not an atrocity. I don't know why they're doing it. The point would be, would not there be similar no. reasons that Israel would be involved no, Israel, with Syria? Israel would never, ever plant a bomb which would blow up its own plane. People. No, we planted the bomb. The I question is not. So that, so, but you say that there is some link with Hindawi and Israel. What is the link? The link is to support the efforts that Iran and Syria are making All right. in the Middle East. Uh, yes. Okay, okay. Oh, okay. The answer is no. Yes. In uh, certain uh, conservative intellectual circles in Washington, quite often your name is raised in connection with uh, an erudite man by the name of Chorba who does a lot of studies in the Middle East area. I'd like to hear your statement about what is your relationship, uh, if any, with Charb. Apparently you had some youthful uh, experiences together. What, uh, what is the total relationship? We, we both shared back in the very early, early 60s, a, uh, in, this, in the city, a center for uh, studies. And we did work in research. But since the late 60s, I've had no contact with uh, with Dr. Uh, with Dr. Cherba. He uh, he has been doing his own uh, work and and good work, I think. But there is no contact. There is no connection in any way. Can, can you put a date on since the late 60s? You say. Oh yeah. Oh yes. What, I what mean, certainly not. Certainly not 1967 or 68. There 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 has been nothing. There are no ties. A good man. A good man. Yes. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes. I am. Yes. Uh, my name is Hoda. I'm from Egypt. Yes. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, if uh, Egypt continues its uh, position, that uh, um, the withdrawal should be uh, from West Bank and Gaza and yes. uh, return of the refugees to their land, the Egyptians will not be sitting in Sinai. Can you elaborate on this? What do you really mean? I don't think you understood what I said. I said that uh, if I had been the prime minister, just as Israel will not give up the West Bank, I would not have given up the Sinai. And therefore, you would not be sitting there, there or now. I am convinced that Egypt will eventually go to war with Israel. I haven't got the slightest doubt of that. What's your estimation to this peace between Egypt and Israel? I don't believe that there is a peace. The fact that there is no war 
For 11 years, there was no war between Nasser and Israel. From 1956 to 1967, did that mean that there was peace? We haven't had war with Jordan now since, since 1967, and there's no treaty. Worth them to you. I don't think it's worth anything. I, I would certainly hope that I'm wrong. I would be overjoyed, and, and I certainly would would not start a war with Egypt. But I don't uh, I don't trust your uh, country. I don't trust. Speaking about Sharon, he was uh, one party to this agreement. Yes, indeed. What in the world makes you think that if a hawk does something stupid, that it's not stupid? Uh, it was a stupid move. What in the world makes him uh, perfect? He isn't perfect. It was a terrible error, a grave mistake. And if you speak to him now, he will say so, so too. Uh, and Moshe Aaron's also, uh, he, he, was, he was at that time anti the treaty, and now he's for it. Uh, it's hard to understand people at, at times. I'm a, a consistent person at the very least.